Welcome to Paris Image Online and to this case study of Marie Antoinette uh, brought to you by Paris Image Production Forum. Uh, the purpose of this roundtable case study is to shine a light on the still ongoing production of Marie Antoinette, a prestigious French series shot in the Paris region uh, aimed at the international market. And we're going to be joined today by Pete Travis, director of episodes one through four. Jean-Baptiste Leclerc, production manager on the series, Madeleine Fontaine, costume designer for the series, and Claude Chely, a series producer from Kappa Drama. Um, before we start talking about the series itself, I think it's helpful to really get into the origins of Marie Antoinette. And for that, I'd like to ask Claude, uh, Kappa TV had previously done three seasons of the television series Versailles uh, that was broadcast on Canal Plus. And after the third and final season, what was the nature of the conversations that led you towards this new series, Marie Antoinette? Before, I just wanted to say that I'm not the only producer. Uh, Kappa is producing with Baninje. You know, through, we are two product, French com production companies. And other producers are Aude Albano, um, Margot uh, Balzan and Stéphanie Chartreux, so three women. So to getting back to your question, um, when we finished Versailles, you know, I, w I was coming from Braco, you know, four seasons of Braco and I did three seasons of Versailles and I really didn't want to do another costume show, really. And we're discussing with other projects with Canon Plus, you know, maybe a, a cop show, another cop show maybe or something and, and suddenly, you know, we were very astonished by the success of Versailles, actually. Versailles has been sold in over 150 countries, you know, almost everywhere in the world. And we started discussing, and well, how about redoing this with, with, with a famous figure of French history? And we had Louis XIV before, and very quickly we decided to do Marie Antoinette. Uh, you know, so it's just a fantastic uh, figure. A fe feminist before before the time, so it, it was actually very easy. Um, and in pursuing this new series, uh, you also followed, and the creative team and the production team followed a similar pattern um, of making a French production but shooting it in English. And why was that important? Well, I don't I don't know if it's important. You know, it's uh, we. We had ambition. We had, uh, you know, we, you know, same ambition as Versailles, and we needed the money to do that. Really, it's really a financial question. Mo mo most, most, uh, most of it, um, because our budget is basically 2.7 million an episode, and it's difficult to gather, you know, such a an amount of money with, you know, within the French territory only. So we decided to, you know, reproduce the same, the same. Same, yeah. Yeah, same, same, same build up of, of a production, um, a French production, you know, but an international project. And, and, and your experience on Versailles showed that that was a workable model. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, and so now that once, like walking us through the, the process, now that there was a decision made to pursue, um, you know, Marie Antoinette as a subject to build a series around her life and um, you know, the, the times of her life. Uh, how did you put together the artistic team? Uh, how, how do you, you, you sought out uh, Deborah uh, Davis, uh, the screenwriter behind the uh, Oscar nominated film The Favorite, and, and, and director Pete Davis um, to direct the first four episodes. Um, how did the team come together? And I'd, I'd love to put the question to you, Pete. I mean, what was, um, what was your first impression of the project and, and, and how did it come into your line of vision? Uh, well, these things always start with the script. Um, Claude and the other producers formed a relationship with Deborah and she wrote something extraordinary. Um, you know, it's great to have an idea that you want to do a series, but it all comes down to the vision of the person that has a point of view about what that would be. Um, and I think we've all been very lucky that Deborah brought her singular vision that to to a subject that we think we all know, but managed to write it in a way where you suddenly realize you don't know anything about her at all. Um, and I think that's what's that's the skill of it. And that, I mean, that, that's the that's the genius of Claude and the French producers for me is that they found a way into a series and a story that everyone thinks they know 
by taking a writer that had done something extraordinary and saying to her, run with it. And she ran somewhere extraordinary with it. And I, I got involved when I read the first the first pilot and it was just mind blowingly awesome. You kind of like, you know, it's the kind of job where you'd stand outside with a baseball bat and beat other people up so they can't do it. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's like it's, the, the, these stories don't come around very often. Um, I was very lucky that Claude asked me to read it and we got on and it went from there. And this is but a really. Oh, all, starts with the word. all starts with the word, it always does. And this is a question that's open really to everyone. Uh, was it always in the plan to shoot in the Paris region? Was there ever an idea of moving this production elsewhere in Europe, or, or, or did that never really enter into the conversation? No, and, uh, it was no question. Um, we wanted to shoot this in Paris. We have Versailles, and we have uh, lots of castles around Versailles, and we have Brice sur marne to build a studio, so why going anywhere else? We, we were lucky that we had the CNC, and we have the region you know, following us, and, you know, and other you know, monies coming to help us, and, but uh, because, because shooting in Paris, you all know, shooting in France is expensive, um, more expensive than Budapest or Bucharest or you know, any other region. But you know, no, uh, we, we had to shoot in Paris, there was no, no question. Did you receive any support to offset some of those costs, regional or national support? Oh yeah, yeah, you know, the region you know, helped us a lot, and the CNC, of course, you know, the international, uh, uh, aspect of, of the CNC, and so yeah, yeah, we we were set up right from the start, really. Um, we also have you know pre sales like from the BBC also and things like that. So you know, and the English language helped in some of yeah, those aspects. And the English, uh, you know, of course. So um, I know that in speaking to you, Pete, as a director, you you talked about taking inspiration from um, the spectacular light you found in locations across the region. Uh, and so when you started location scouting for your work on this series, how did that affect your own creative process? Um, well, you look, you're looking for locations to find a way to, you know, tell you something about the characters. Clearly, you know, there's Versailles, which is, you know, a given, and we were lucky to have access to that extraordinary place, you know, one day a week. Um, um, and then you're going to look at other places that can double for Versailles or can be different places. And you're always looking at the script and going, how can how can we envisage this story? Um, and there's something about the story which is about kind of innocence lost and about someone, a young woman, kind of being taken somewhere against her will and then turning into something extraordinary. And that just, it's always, you're always looking at ways in which a location can illustrate that story. And for me, it's always about the light. You know, it's, um, location is not about the wallpaper or the furniture. It's about what's it going to look like on the camera and what can the light do to il illuminate the inner life of the character. Because Deborah created an extraordinary character in Marion's Run Out in our story. And um, the light had to be special because the character was special. In terms of the found locations that you used, uh, you also used them for a little bit of problem solving, which of course is part and parcel of every creative uh, professional's job, problem solving, making do with uh, whatever means you have. And I, I know that there's a specific case with a, a castle that sort of was reused for different purposes, one towards a very effervescent ballroom scene and one to represent uh, something a lot gloomier and a little bit more depressing. And that was, I believe, the... Um, the Chateau du Marais. And can you talk to me about how you use some of the found locations for multiple purposes, uh, Pete or, or Jean Baptiste as well? Well, the cast castles yeah. are not. Uh, um, go ahead, Pete. Go ahead, Pete. Sorry. The castles are not. Um, you know, they're all expensive because they're you know ancient, you know national monuments, most of them. Um, but inevitably, you know, you fall in love with places and say, "I love this and I love that," and then you come to put a practical working schedule together. And you go, well, I wanted to do the ballroom there, but oh, well, where else am I going to do? You have to make a whole day of filming to fill a schedule. And sometimes that's not always possible because you might fall in love with a place that's only really half a day's filming. So we had to, you have to accept sometimes that you have to find different ways to make your vision real. And personally, I find making those kind of decisions really exciting because it's, it's a lot of fun to try and make a place look like one thing and another. And it means we get more time on screen. You know, we save money. We're not we're not wasting time on double location fees, and it's just it's part, those kind of decisions 
I think one one of the things that for me was very special about this project was we had those challenges all the time because you never have enough money and you never have enough time. And when you've got a production team and a producer and uh, line producers that are everywhere, everyone's involved in making those decisions together, it makes it really enjoyable. You don't ever feel like you're compromising what you're doing because everyone's trying to make the best for the show. And that was one of the things that was very special about this. Sorry, JB, you were going to talk about that. No, 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 that, that's well, exactly what I wanted to say. Well, I mean, other than Versailles and other than Chateau du Marais, what were some of the other locations that popped up on screen that, that, that facilitated the production? Uh, the Chateau de Versailles is the most important because um, we had to, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to shoot in a national castle because of many things. But one of the things is everything is very fragile and it's very preserved and protected. So when you arrive with a, a 180 uh, crew uh, people, it's very uh, tricky to, to, make, to take care of everything. So there are a lot of things that we recreate on stage because you, we are in our place, on our set. Nothing is uh, uh, fragile and uh, as expensive as in the real castle. Uh, and, but there are some things that you can't um, build on stage. The Hall of Mirrors, La Galerie des Glaces in Chateau de Versailles, there's no way you can make it on stage. Uh, and also the, 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 the castle itself, when you're outside, the marble yard or the, the gardens of all these castles. So we, had, we shared uh, the time uh, we shot between uh, stage, uh, studio and uh, locations. Uh, so when, when you when you are there and when you, when you start building uh, on stage, uh, you have to uh, make a calculation of how you will use what you built and how you have to go outside uh, for having a, a reality and a, and a wider uh, landscape uh, to be shot. To clarify that. The um, Chateau Versailles is open to productions only on Mondays. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's the day. That's where correct. Close to yeah, you, you can only shoot in Chateau de Versailles when it's closed to uh, public and tourists. Does, it's closed to the public, so but it never stops Monday. working. <laughs> it's no. working, working for somebody <laughs> yeah, else. It's not easy. And you, we shot also a, a, a lot in uh, Versailles as well. Uh, the previous series of Capa in uh, Chateau de Volvicomte, which is also a beautiful and huge. A national castle that is only open for shooting on Monday and Tuesday. But Monday we keep it for Versailles, so we we could not we could only shoot in Volvicomte on Tuesdays. So it's not easy, and uh, it it makes the the schedule very uh, tricky to uh, uh, to be built. Madeleine, I'd love to talk about your inspiration on the project. Um, I mean, the first season takes place over the course of a decade from 1770 till 1780. And as, as a costume designer, how do you track the passage of time through discrete visual elements like that? Well, we had a big help from the scenario for the script because uh, it gives us all the indications of how she was when she arrives in this new world, uh, um, scary and, and, and fantastic and scary, how she's, she's uh, closed, um, encaged, in, in the costume and in the uh, the protocol, in the etiquette, and how she f slowly but surely will will get free of it as as far as she can uh, until she c becomes to be the queen, and then she can decide by herself. But it's 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 e I mean it's not easy, but it's obvious the way we have to to make the change from the cage to the relative freedoms than she can have when she goes out of all this heavy thing, which is the castle, the costumes, the, the rules. And when she has a, a smaller apartment uh, behind the, the, the screen and uh, how she works, she works to go to Trianon and how she works to, to get free of this heavy thing. And so it was written on the script and, and we worked on that. And she's a, a, a really a kid when she arrives and she becomes a, a, a woman on the way. So we had a lot of uh, elements to, to work on the changes. 
And in the period between 1770 and 1780 saw of obviously changing of uh, the royal regime in France uh, from Louis the Fifteenth to Louis the Sixteenth, and 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 you know it was quite a period of social upheaval even pre-revolution. Um, and I was wondering how you depict the period, the changing of a of an epoch as a as a kind of visual element as well. I'm sorry, I didn't understand all the questions. Oh, just, I mean, that, that period where the first season is set yeah. was a period of like a, a immense social change as yeah, well. Sure. Um, yeah. And I was wondering how that sort of manifests itself in, in the costumes and in the visual elements of the series. But I can't say precisely, but it's, it's a feeling. I mean, it's uh, these two kids, they don't, and they're not ready at all to be, to be king and queen. They're just um, a bit afraid of, of what's coming to us, to them, sorry. And um, and this this turn of the story is very sensitive. I mean, yet something gonna happen. We don't know exactly what, but it's turning. We feel it's turning, and uh, we don't know yet. Actually, what. the the first season actually um, doesn't have much of that because uh, because you know in in at the end of the first season in 1780. Marie Antoinette is really the queen of Versailles. You know? Yeah, she is. Mm. The French people love her. You know, she's she's a fashion idol. You know, she's she's the, the fashion queen. She's she's um, she's up there. She's really. a figure. And yeah. it, it's funny that when you think of it, but in 1780 and nine years later, only nine years later, it's the downfall. <laughs> so basically, the second season is very much about it. You know, but about the downfall, the going back, going down. So, but the first season, social upheaval, yeah, in the country, in the countryside, I think, but you don't feel, you know, Mary Antoinette was on top. No, but you feel that everybody, a lot of people are against her and are fighting to destroy the power she can have. We don't know exactly what's going on with that when we are in the first episodes, but it's, it's behind, I think. In terms of, like, a technical challenge and a technical uh, logistical difficulties while, while making this series. I, I know that the costume department ran into uh, a, a strange issue uh, this past November when 11 other period productions were happening in Paris around more or less simultaneously. And uh, I was wondering, how, well, how does a production respond to uh, a challenge like that? But we had the chance when we started, when Marie started to go around Europe to see what was uh, available it was already two projects uh, going on, running, but we found, she found what she needed for the extras uh, to have a stock, to have a basic stock. And according to that, she decided to make some little series to make it ours and uh, to, to have the control of the, the, the colors and everything. But we had, the, we had what we needed for, for the project. It's after. And it has been more complicated for the one coming because two or three with, with uh, Marie Antoinette were already on. And they are series, so it's a very long time where the costumes are just not available for the other ones. So I don't know why <laughs> it's, it's such a fashion of We're this lucky. period, but we've been lucky. Yeah. Um, talking about I mean, length. All the main costumes are designed. I mean, all the costumes of the main characters are all, you know, drawn and designed and made by hand for them individually so there's no issues with the main cast the questions of those things come when you're finding costumes for all the extras um. and i i asked yesterday uh, marie and carel to count to have an idea because you asked me how many costumes have been made it's like 90 for the for the women and about six, 65 for the men and it's not one piece for each <laughs> costume it's like three or four or five we have already what they have they were under uh, for the women and um, it's a lot of work because it's a hand work and it makes it takes like uh, two weeks i mean 10 days for a dress they so made all the embroideries for instance all the embroideries the, the it buttons it and you know everything everything is made in-house in-house meaning where yeah. At, at Brice sur marne ah, a that very leads precious me, place that leads precious me to place. my next question yeah so <laughs> Since um, about April in 2020, this yeah. the production has been based out of the studio Brie in Brie sur Marne. Mm, uh, it started a little bit after uh, April. I think this, the the workshop starts no later. But I mean, I knew that they were already working on it. 
to yeah. find the yeah. fabrics and so on. But the, the workshop in Brie starts in May, end okay. of May, okay. beginning of June, because I was just coming back from, from Kent. And, and that's also where, um, you know, all of the massive sets have been built for the, on the sound stages at the Studio de Brie. Very clever yes. set. C Very can you, clever set. I, I'd love to know about some of these sets. Like, what would you say some of the more flagship sets have been? And, and this is really open to, to everyone, but uh, of, of, of the sets built for this first season, what are some of the more elaborate ones? What are the some of the more clever ones, as you had said? Pete? Uh, Pete? Sorry, Sorry. Yeah, Pete has to say that. Um, I think um, Pierre, the, des the designer, I did an extraordinary job with the sets because um, we're not we're not making a documentary where we're trying to you know completely recreate every every room in Versailles. We're finding a way to take inspiration from those things and tell the story that we have to tell, which is the story that Deborah's told, and and he did that beautifully. I think so. You know, certainly the, in the block I did, the, the mem we we the memorable scene, the memorable sets were um, Marie Antoinette's the Queen's bedchamber, where we filmed probably at least a week, if not more there. Um, the, the the wonderful private cabinets that were at the back of that, which were small and beautiful. Um, Madame de Barry's bedroom. Um, there was a big room that was uh, at once the King's bedchamber and the King's office um, on another stage. We had two stages running at the same time. I think uh, there was endless kind of wonderful corridors because there's lots of scenes of people moving between one place and another. Uh, Louis had a bedroom, um, Provence had a bedroom. Even on the stage, um, big rooms would go from one point to, from being Louis's bedroom to being Provence's bedroom and Marie Antoinette's bed. I mean, and um, Madame de Barry's bedroom was changed into an office for the for, for block two. Um, so there's lots of even there the, the the multiplicity of the ways particular rooms could be changed from one thing to another is is what makes the whole process of being in the studio kind of seamless and also very, very efficient. Because even there we were multi-purposing stages and sets and rooms um, between each between each block. We need to be organized, you know, basically, because you have, you have to redress so all these the rooms. Main, the main thing that we're doing, the main thing that's special about the sets for me is the light. We had a big discussion early on about how we were going to light the show. And it's mostly lit from that side. So it's lit naturally through the windows. I mean, there are lights on the stage, but the, it, it's supporting the light that comes through the windows. And that was a big decision that makes it look like it looks. That's the reason why it looks so beautiful, um, primarily, um, uh, the light coming in from outside. Um, and that that was to kind of capture, again, the same, the same beautiful light that you had on locations. Because sometimes it's easy to tell the difference between a studio set and a real location. And usually that's because in a real location, the light comes from the windows. And on a stage, a lot of the time it comes from above. We just we we decided not to do that, so you couldn't really tell the difference. And the the light that you had in a real place would be as magical on the stage as it is in a real place. And I think that's a tribute to our cinematographers um, and to the set designer. They made it seamless, which is a challenge. I mean, you know, on any given artificial environment like a soundstage. Yeah, but and the it's, light crosses it's, the it's rooms. No, it's a challenge, but it's it's one that. Um, people are used to doing um what's what's great about it is that you I, I defy anybody to tell the difference between the real places and the sets really you know you can't tell the difference you know no it, they, they're lit the same they look as beautiful as they are the, the camera movement is the same in what in in the real places as, as in the, as it is in the stage everything feels like it's real and has a real feeling about it and that's one of the things we wanted to do because what deborah's script does beautifully is it makes you imagine you're really there with Marie Antoinette. It makes you imagine you don't know the end of this story. And that was the driving force of the creative approach to, to match what's in the script, which is let's imagine we're back there with her at that time and we don't know what's gonna happen. And that's that's been the kind of grounding thing for all of us, I think. With an overall estimate, I mean, give or take a number, um, how many speaking roles would you say the first season features? I would say close to 50, something like that. And um, I mean, much of the cast is uh, European in background. I mean, the, the series is uh, lead actress, uh, Emilia Schuler, uh, and then is from 
born in Russia and raised in Germany. Uh, and then there's a good number of French uh, natives, English speaking, of course, in front of the camera, but Roxane Durand, Gaia Weiss, and Caroline Piet um, uh, are all examples of actresses or actors that lead the series uh, while, while performing in English and, and, and using, you know, this diverse cast as an example, do you find that it's become easier to find um, English fluent European talent? Has, has that changed in recent time? That's well, a question. Is, is, from, from experience, actually, doing the casting, we cast a lot of people. Uh, so, you know, in England, in France, you know, in other countries, you know, obviously. And we actually, we're, I, was, I was personally very, very surprised to see how many French young actors, you know, spend three, four months in England, you go to the theater, you know, some classes, and a lot of French, this new generation of French uh, actors, you know, they, they speak French, obviously, they speak English, and some of them speak other languages too. I think it's necessary now for, for these actors to be, to be able to play, you know, it's international now, of course the platforms are international, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, we, we, you'll see these young French actors, that, you, that some of them, you quoted, uh, are incredible. Uh, in their English is incredible. And, and Don't you think so? It is, yeah. It is. As an English person, it is, yeah. You can't, you can't tell the difference between uh, the English-speaking, the, the, the native English speakers and the French. Uh, I mean, and even in, in German and Russian for certain markets, too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, so we're in an international world, but one that's been a little bit bruised and battered uh, over the past couple of years. And we, it would be remiss not to mention um, you know, there are a number of British actors uh, in the cast, including two of the leads. Um, and I was wondering what kind of logistical issues uh, you know the cast faced uh, in, in a world that's marked by uh, Brexit, uh, which is thankfully over in a way, and the pandemic, which is not at all. Uh, and so how did uh, the production deal with challenges of visas and also mobility issues for talent coming over from England? Vis visas is not an issue, not a, not a real issue, because you, you need a visa uh, if you stay more than 90 days, which was not the case for many of them. We have to know, we, have to know, we don't forget that Emilia Schule, Marie Antoinette, is German. Uh, um, and some of the other main cast uh, are not uh, British. They are uh, they have, they've got other passports, so it's it's not been a, a real issue uh, about uh, visas. Uh, the, the main issue was the COVID, the pandemic. Uh, because of uh, isolation time, we had to uh, have uh, when you when uh, British uh, actors were coming into France. Uh, that was the main reason why. For instance, we asked them not to go back to UK for the Christmas break, but to stay uh, here in France and to celebrate uh, Christmas and uh, New Year's Eve here in France with some of uh, their family, uh, because it, it was a little bit scary not to have them back on the 3rd of Jan when we start shooting again. I mean, Brexit, Brexit is an issue because it takes the UK out of Europe, so inevitably the rules about how they deal with COVID are different. So that's why the travel between the UK and France was tricky. Um, it's not yeah. between France and the rest of Europe. It's perfectly fine between France and the rest of yes. Europe. Just unfortunately, we live in a rather weird, stupid country that's decided it doesn't want to be European anymore. So <laughs> difficult for us. I heard James Purfoy after the Sorry, I heard James Purfoy at a fitting when he could be able to come back to France because he didn't have any passport anymore because he gave it to have the visa mm -hmm. and he, he couldn't come. So he had to yes, wait, you're right. you're he, had, right. he had to wait until yeah. he has his visa and passport to come back for a fitting. And he said, give me back my friends, <laughs> give me back my European friends, my visa. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's the right. Europe. You need to find an Irish grandfather, you know, it's the only <laughs> way. Um, one of the issues is losing an actor to, um, obviously visa issues, I'm losing an actor to mobility issues. There's also the larger issue or another issue of losing an actor to COVID quarantine. And I, I wonder um, what some of the safety protocols that the production used and if they were adhering, if they were adhering to a, um, a global, or not global, but a, a local safety protocol that's 
uh, across the Ile de France film production industry, if they're specific to individual productions? How, how does that work in terms of safety protocols shooting right now? Well, you have here the guru of um, the safety protocol, Jean Baptiste. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, uh, the, we we fortunately we never lost any actor because of COVID. Uh, the only unreplaceable people we lost for COVID is uh, Mr. Travis. <laughs> so we had, we had, we had to stop uh, one week because uh, unfortunately it was uh, positive. Uh, but since uh, we started. We never had a COVID in the in the in the cast, which is uh, wonderful. But we test uh, actors every morning in, uh, with a antigenic uh, test, and uh, we test everybody, the crew, the the actors, even the extras, uh, twice a week uh, with a PCR test. So we have a, quite a clear vision about the the the, the, the circulation of uh, COVID in the in the in the crew. And right now, since we started again uh, on the, in Jan, uh, we had uh, two, three, today, not, today zero uh, people infected every day. But as we catch them early in the morning before they start working, we can send them back home and uh, uh, call uh, people to uh, replace them uh, in a rush. And uh, it, it works. But we have to be very, uh, very careful uh, using, we use masks, uh, uh, we use uh, hydroalcoholic gel. Uh, we do our best uh, not to, um, to take risks. And are those protocols, I mean, bottom up coming from the production or are they top down coming from the entire uh, production industry in, in France or in, in the Paris region? This production as it's from ready. the production, that's our own uh, responsibility. From the start, we decided to be very strict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a long shoot. I mean, we started in August and we finish in February, so we have to go go through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so, a it's a it's a marathon. It's a marathon. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah. For for the international team or for the people that uh, part of the international team that I guess that's going to be you, Pete. On this case, uh, speaking of this one, what were some of the surprises and uh, unexpected benefits that you found while shooting in Paris or in the Paris region? Um, well, I think I'd, I'd, not, I'd never shot in uh, in France before. Um, I, I would say the thing that stands out the most is the collaborative nature of the team. I, I, I've not worked somewhere for a long time where where everybody trusts everyone. It's very easy to, you know, uh, I think, and I, I have to say we have to thank Claude and the other producers for that, C creating a, an environment where people are hired and then trusted to, to run with it. That's a very precious commodity that and 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 uh, and it, it gets the best out of everybody and it makes it a joy to come to work every day because you feel that level of trust that that for me is the most special thing um uh that that was certainly what made it something i, I and obviously you don't know it's going to be that um, you get a feeling when you meet someone first time um and because of covid we actually did all our meetings online like this we never actually met till you know we were all hired um which was strange um, but I think that trust was, it's, it was just and also a wonderful professionalism, I think, about it makes a real difference when you're coming to talk about how, whether you can afford to do this and this when everyone's on the same page and you just, you don't, and everyone's making the creative decisions with the show in mind the most. And that's pretty unique, I think. And that was what we made, certainly for me, coming from the UK, but that made working in France very special. And that's all about uh jb and claude and the other producers the environment that they created to make that happen that's what you need to make international productions work that that belief that everyone has an important part to play and creating an environment where people feel trusted and safe um that was that's what made it special and we're together yeah thank you claude for that because mm. you are yeah sure thank you and uh, madeline you from uh, good amount of success working in the international industry as well. Um, and so I'm wondering how that maybe shapes your perspective of the French industry, of the local industry. You've got a toe in both waters. And then how, how do you translate that a little bit? I don't know how I can, how I can translate that. But I w when I worked uh, away with the different crews, I can, I can feel if they have been used to work more with American productions or not. 
because there are more people, more, there are more numerous on, on American production, which doesn't mean more efficient, but more people. Uh, I think we know here in France how to work with just the right people at the right place. It's not proud, it's not, you know, pretentious, but that's what I, I, I could uh, uh, experiment when I worked in the States. When I work in the, the, the eastern countries where I used to go the production sometimes, European, French or American, I can say how it works according to who they are used to work with. And uh, I mean, I, I like the way we work together here. Most of the time it's, uh, you know, it's just convenient. When you have the, when you have what you need to make the things good, it works. And the trust what, is the first what thing. What it comes down to is, is trust. I mean, essentially when you're making a series like this, you're asking a bunch of people to help you push a very ridiculous boat up a very high mountain. <laughs> it's a completely <laughs> ridiculous idea. And if people don't trust each other, no one wants to push a boat up a mountain. And it's only trust and wonderful collaboration that makes it happen. And that's what that's in my experience, that's what's made this project so special. That's we pushed a huge boat up a huge mountain and we were only able to do that because people trusted each other and, and there was a a real sense that we were making something very special. I think that's the other thing that makes a difference. People really aware that this was this was a project that was really original, it had a very original voice and it had something unique to say. Well and I mean, everybody gives the best can do. You've Is pushed yeah. you've pushed the boat nearly up the mountain there's still a there's still a little bit of a few a few more days of production to go uh and hopefully the beginning of production on season two which is in the not too distant future not happening tomorrow anytime soon but um the question i want to close on is uh, with an eye towards that not too distant future um and based on your recent experience what could bolster and and, and make production in the Paris region more fluid, easier? I would talk about the studios. We really need to consider that seriously. In which way? I mean, uh, we, I mean for me, the only studios that are really efficient are Brie, where we worked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we need an, uh, a new, uh, how do you call that, the back lot, mm -hmm. which is now nearly destroyed. I shot just be just before on an Asterix and we made Shanghai streets there and it was last, the last time we could do that because it's just falling in ruins, into ruins. We can't shoot now anymore in this part. We don't have any back lots and they, I mean, they have to consider we, we, that. We, I mean, studios are, are so convenient for projects like that, very long projects, you know, with, with you know, can you imagine going to the castle all over Paris with, with, the, with the driving now? around Paris, trying to reach the place for all the actors and everybody within the time schedule. Uh, it's, a, it's a nightmare. And so it's so convenient to have a, your own place. And where, where of you course. And, and especially this one, which is very easy to, to, to come in. I've been shooting in Bretigny, which is in project to make a studio there too, mm -hmm. in all the army place. But it takes one hour to go and one hour to come back. Who can? working in cinema with the, the schedule we have, take this time on his working time. It's not on his working time then, it's on his private time. And we really need to, to consider one that. The, one of the advantages of Paris, because all the studios in the UK that are equivalent to London are an hour and a half away from the central London. Oh, yes. Oh, and, but, they, but they are big well, enough to... I mean, studio that's, there, like, yeah. that's like Paris Saint-Main, that's not at least an hour and 20 minutes away from central London. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Breeze half an hour from London, yeah. half an hour from and, Paris. And the real, the real luxury we had, we had everything in the studio de Brie, the carpenter workshop, the painting workshop, the costumes the workshop, studio, the production the offices, one. the stage, the, everything was there. So it's very easy for everybody, in, uh, for, for the director as well, and the, all the production uh, stakeholders to go from one place to another in, uh, in five minutes. Uh, if you have been spread all over uh, Paris area, it's a, it's a and it, contri it contributes, as as Pete was saying, to the collaborative uh, aspect to yes. filmmaking yeah, because everything is there. We we all meet all the time. We spend the day together, you know. So you know, 
better get along <laughs> with each other. You it know, it so feels strangely old fashioned. It feels like the way people used to make films a long time ago, which mm. is some places has been lost. And I say that in the nicest possible way. I don't, I don't mean old fashioned. I mean with a camaraderie of spirit and being in one place definitely makes that possible. Um, uh, it's like you said, you want to you want to open up a door to the past with this series. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but with a look towards the future, then I guess the the takeaway that we could have is that in order to ensure and to you know facilitate productions that run smoothly, that are able to tackle ambitious subjects with an ambitious scope um, and an ambitious technical elan, really additional studio space is probably one of the yeah, most important and we have things to, to be able to do it together because it's it's really the the, the aim of uh, of this kind of projects is to to do it to build it to work on it together. So we need the place for that. And as uh, Jean-Baptiste just said, this is a real studio which has been made for construction, painting, uh, and everything. Well, there it is, folks. New studios, you know, the sooner you can build them. If you build it, they will come to end on a... For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to thank every yes. all of the participants yes. of this panel. Uh, it was very illuminative and um, very engaging, and I, I had a great time. So uh, also, uh, I can't wait to see Marie-Antoinette. When When is it due to air in 2020? Or no, no idea. No idea? <laughs> no, uh, no, probably the end of 2022. I have to say a word for Marie, which has been my assistant for years and helped me on Versailles, and now is in charge of the, the costume design the on this series. I started with her mm -hmm. to put her on the line, and I'm very proud of what she did. Fantastic. Very happy, because it's the continuity. Well, that's great. Uh, everybody, watch Versailles. Look out for Marie's work. Uh, <laughs> end of 2022, it's going to be on Canal Plus in France, BBC Two in the UK, and uh, hopefully more sales and to come. Everywhere. <laughs> and everywhere. <Yep>. And everywhere. <laughs> so if you're somewhere, you can see Marie Antoinette. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.